and free market economies um, more deeply and more quickly than, any, than anyone else. Um, and as a transatlantic partner, the U.S., as much as the EU, would love to try to replicate uh, the process of democratization in the wider Black Sea region. Um, yet, there are certain realities that have emerged that have challenged the strength of this, um, uh, of EU's normative power in, in this region and, and also in the South, uh, in the Western Balkans. Uh, those realities are many. They include um, a deeper cultural and economic divide between um, certain countries in the Black Sea and, and Europe. Um, there's a certain a, a type of annoyance with uh, Europe's asymmetrical power arrangements. Um, there are also um, internal EU institutional problems that have not yet been resolved and seem to be limiting um, EU's ex further expansion or further influence um, farther afield. Uh, it's important, I think, to have this meeting in Washington to have uh, a discussion about those limitations and how they might be overcome because democratization obviously is, a, is an important um, policy goal for the U.S. and the EU. And to that end, we have two uh, um, speakers today who will, will just go uh, in order that they appear on the, on the program. I won't go too deeply in, into their background because you can uh, read about it in the, in the handout. Um, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes, and we'll start with Alexandros Patterson, who's program director of the Caspian Europe Center in Brussels. Well, thanks a lot, um, and thanks a lot for staying around for the for the third panel. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, all the partners, the many partners that have put together this uh, conference today. I think it's so far been quite um, thought-provoking and insightful, actually, in many ways. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about what is truly, I think, a transatlantic dynamic that has and continues to encourage good governance in three states of the broader Black Sea region. Those are Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey. Uh, and at the same time, this is a dynamic that I think uh, can provide lessons for the rest of the broader Black Sea region, however you would like to define that, whether that expands into the Caspian area or you're talking about Ukraine, uh, Moldova as well. Now, this dynamic is chiefly manifested in the development of what has been called the East-West Transport Corridor, which, which is a network really of infrastructure that's made up of energy pipelines, roads, railroads, electricity links that physically connect these countries to Europe and what I'm going to term the broader West because I am talking about uh, Europe, the U.S., NATO, Norway, not an EU member. So I think West is really the, the only term that can be used. Um, and I argue that the, the development of these links and the process of securing them is leading to better governance and to greater ties with transatlantic institutions. Now, I should add that along with the various uh, governments involved with the international institutions, or Western, if you want to call them international institutions involved in this process, you also have uh, what I would call Western international financial institutions. So I'm going to talk about today the World Bank's efforts, but also the private sector. Um, BP, for example, is invo in involved in this evolving dynamic that I'm going to talk about. Now, I define good governance, and this is important, as encompassing everything. Of course, we think of good governance as gr greater representative government. But at the same time, good governance has a lot to do with efficient, greater efficiency, professionalization of the state and state officials. And I'm going to more focus on that, um, the functional aspects of good governance, if you will, uh, which in many ways, especially from a European perspective, have been uh, important in paving the way, if you will, for other aspects of good governance that are more popular to talk about. Now, I'm not going to go on about the infrastructural projects that I mentioned. I think most people here are likely familiar with uh, the BTC pipeline, its partner, uh, the oil pipeline from the Caspian to the Mediterranean through these three countries. Uh, familiar with its partner pipeline, the Baku Tbilisi Erzurum or South Caucasus natural gas pipeline. Uh, you then also have the uh, Baku Cars Railway from Azerbaijan through Georgia to Turkey. Um, and the most important thing to keep in mind, however, is that the transport corridor is not one pipeline or one railroad. It's a vast multitude of infrastructural connections that binds the states to Europe in a functional way, so that there are, in fact, incentives involved. People are making money off of this. Uh, there's infrastructure involved, the ties need to be kept active. Uh, I'm going to speak today about three examples of the corridor facilitating Western integration. 
in Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey to some extent as well. And all are examples of what you might call spillover. Now, you don't really need to be uh, you know, uh, familiar with the theoretical term of spillover. To, it's essentially, you know, in functional areas, uh, it has been seen, if you will, that uh, you ha can have a spillover effect of good governance from these functional technical areas, infrastructure to society, governance, et cetera. First example is BP's implementation of a regulatory framework called the Voluntary Principles in providing for security and dealing with government and local populations <coughs> with regards to its pipeline projects in Azerbaijan and Georgia. And those of, for those of you not familiar, Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights is a legally binding set of provisions drawn up by the State Department here and the UK Foreign Office, as well as a number of NGOs, including Oxfam and Human Rights Watch and others, uh, that govern the responsibility of extractive companies in providing security for their projects. Now, BP and other Western companies involved, I'm thinking of Hess, Statoil, signed up to, these, signed up to this framework, as did the governments of Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey, uh, as part of the deal to go ahead with the development of many projects in, the, in this east-west transport corridor. Now, the implementation process of the principles in Azerbaijan and Georgia has actually been highlighted as a best practice example uh, to be used in other parts of the world. So we're not sort of talking about the basket case here in what are admittedly difficult countries. This has, uh, by outside observers' accounts, been a successful project. <coughs> and it involves trading Azerbaijani and Georgian security, police, and military units for the protection of the corridor in what are believed to be Western standards of human rights and professional conduct. It involves ethical relations with the local communities. Uh, it involves development projects as well as uh, environmental protection and uh, projects of judiciary reform. So as you can see, there is a spillover effect. It involves uh, <coughs> as well, uh, uh, I mean, for example, <coughs> BP has um, provided Western Standard training for Azerbaijan's national police. Uh, you may ask now, you know, how much of this is, is being retained? I mean, they may, may well be trained. Does it change the, you know, how long is this going to be around for? Well, uh, the lifespan of these projects is 40 years. Uh, and these, uh, uh, the, the companies involved and the governments involved are obligated to uh, continue the, the implementation of these principles for the lifespan of those uh, infrastructural projects, and for therefore it's to some extent a long-term deal. The second example, I would say, is the role of international financial institutions like the World Bank in the development. Now, it can easily be argued, uh, and people involved, in fact, on all sides, the business side, the government side, and the non-profit side of the, of the transport corridor project, say that the development of, for example, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline and much of the transport corridor would not have been possible were it not for the financial assistance, but more importantly, the reputational clout that an institution like the World Bank provides for international investors to come into the project. Now, as one World Bank official put it to me, World Bank programs are a complete package. A government cannot choose a la carte what it aspects it wants to comply with. So along with World Bank support for the corridor, the World Bank uh, has good governance control of its construction and operation. Uh, it's involved in programs creating greater transparency and professionalization uh, as sort of adjunct programs to the construction of the corridor in many of the ministries in Azerbaijan and Georgia. Uh, significant rule of law reform, environmental protection programs, etc. that I explained. The bank is deeply involved in fostering transparency, and this is an important adjunct piece, in Azerbaijan's admittedly uh, notoriously corrupt energy sector. Uh, for example, building SOFAS, the state oil fund of Azerbaijan, built, uh, modeled on Norway's state uh, oil fund, and monitoring compliance with the, what's called the Extraction Industry Transparency Initiative, EITI. Now, if we're not over for the World Bank's role in the corridor, many sections of both the Azerbaijan and Georgian governments would not, would not likely have seen the benefits of the bank's attendant programs which are, in fact, some of the most intrusive anywhere, uh, but interestingly have been implemented with significant cooperation from the governments. Uh, that's you know, a piece that hasn't been brought out as much as it should, that in fact this is a two-way process that has so far, as I said, by the accounts of outside observers, been quite successful.
And the third example, I'm going to be brief because my colleague Fabrizio is going to speak about this is the European Union's broader role, but I'm going to focus a little bit on um, uh, the, the European Union's involvement in the transport corridor in terms of technical, functional aspects that have a spillover effect on good governance. And I'm thinking here mainly of three uh, initiatives, if you will. The first is Traseca, which you probably know, the Transport Corridor Europe Caucasus Asia, <coughs> which is um, as interesting now, interestingly now been sort of co-opted by the governments of the region. And in many ways, people will say, well, that's because, in fact, it was not a particularly successful project. Well, uh, it partnered with its sort of energy partner, InnoGate, which stands for I Interstate Oil and Gas Transport to Europe. Both have uh, provided important technical assistance, uh, safety and professionalization standards to do with uh, the infrastructure that I'm talking about, <clears throat> which again has an important spillover effect on the region and provides to some extent, I would say, a Western integratory effect uh, which uh, links the governments into good governance measures that are then, because of the incentives involved with energy and transport infrastructure, difficult to sort of wheel your way out of. Um, and so far, they, in fact, haven't uh, necessarily tried to do that. Uh, as I said, there's been significant cooperation from the host governments. The third of the, of the EU uh, initiatives, uh, which I think is significant, this is looking into the future, is the expansion of the energy community, or uh, what was called the sort of Athens process in the Balkans, which linked the Balkans' energy uh, grids and the energy system into... Uh, that of the European Union. And that is set to expand to Turkey, and it's set uh, in the future to expand to the Caucasus as well. Uh, and in many ways, that will have a significant integratory effect, a significant effect on good governance, uh, again, because there are all kinds of mandates that come along with, uh, the, you know, similar to the ones I've already detailed, with the EU's involvement uh, and the country's involvement in that project. Now, let me try to... Uh, I'm, I'm being sort of... Uh, provocative in my comments because I'd like to get some good questions telling me how um, I'm being overly optimistic. Um, but to address some of them, um, you, also, you may say, you know, well, these are just pipelines and roads, and how significant can they, could they possibly be? Well, aside from the purely economic benefits they bring, the strategic sin significance of these functional links, I think, needs to be underlined, and they have to some extent this morning. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of these functional links are key to Azerbaijan's lifeblood, the export of its hydrocarbons to the outside world. Due to the geopolitical realities we have to some extent explored, Russia to the north, Iran to the south, Armenia to the southwest, and its uh, strong links with Russia, um, Georgia presents not only the sole route through which Azerbaijan can forge ties with the broader west, but also the needle's eye through which the countries of the Caspian and Central Asia can form similar strategically vital links between East and West. And it's also important to, to note that on, if you look at this in the bigger picture, uh, this East-West transport corridor I'm talking about involving these three countries <coughs> is in many ways the missing link, uh, if you trace the infrastructure, uh, between a corridor that runs from Shanghai to London, or the other way around as well. So the process I've described is largely one of transatlantic institutions encouraging good governance through energy development in the broader Black Sea region. However, the positive externalities of this East-West transport corridor, I think, have the potential to be much greater. I think through proposed transnational corridor, uh, um, I'm sorry, transport corridor projects, pro <laughs> projects in other parts of the Black Sea region, whether you expand this into the Caspian region, whether you uh, think about uh, all kinds of possibilities of expanding that energy corridor into Ukraine. Uh, uh, Kyiv is quite uh, enthusiastic about doing so. Uh, and uh, there's any number of, of projects we've spoken about Nabucco today, but there's also projects for Whitestream, two different options for that, uh, which would uh, go uh, through, through Ukraine to Romania or possibly straight across the uh, Black Sea itself. Uh, now, it's interesting to note that in terms of the example that I gave, the main example, the, the baku tbilisi jehan pipeline, uh, the first step was largely pushed by the United States and Turkey. Brussels 
and other European capitals only furtively joined the BTC bandwagon, if you will, despite the fact that Europe benefits the most from the alternative routes being constructed and has a much more acute energy problem and in many ways has much more interest in good governance and stability uh, in the region. And so for that reason, I think it's important to, to end my presentation by underlining that for the next few steps in the process that need to be taken, many of them underlined by our speakers this morning, uh, Europe is going to need to be at the forefront <coughs> as opposed to the follow-up in order for them to be effective. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, we'll now turn to Fabrizio Tessinari, who splits his time between um, uh, Denmark, uh, Brussels, and here at Johns Hopkins Center as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nida. Um, I'll try to keep it short and sharp. I have been asked to, to speak about the EU and democracy promotion, and I, I can't help uh, starting by saying that Really, for me, to, to put these two phrases in the same sentence is a really an anger management <coughs> exercise, especially here in the U.S. And, and, and of course, uh, it's difficult to explain what the EU does in terms of democracy uh, promotion, how it does it, and, and, and if it does it at all. Uh, so what I will do is essentially three things. I will try to explain briefly what is the mechanism, the main mechanism that the EU has in place when it comes to democracy promotion. I will try to explain why this mechanism is underperforming. And thirdly, I'll try to briefly give a few ideas as to what it should be done, and it, to some extent it is being done, to improve this mechanism. Well, the mechanism is in itself is pretty simple. Um, and and, and the, the one place where we should start in that respect is obviously the enlargement. Enlargement has been the main democracy uh, promotion instrument the EU has devised so far, uh, essentially because there was a very clear trade-off. The incentives were clear, membership in the European Union, as well as, of course, uh, certain financial incentives. And in exchange, there were very tough and strict conditions on the rule of law, protection of minorities, uh, divisions of power, independence of the judiciary, and so forth. So the trade-off was clear, the incentives were clear. In this region right now, we have, the European Union has essentially three policies. Um, there is still the enlargement, and we spoke about it earlier this morning in relation to Turkey. There is the neighborhood policy that we also mentioned, and then there is the strategic partnership with Russia. Well, my core argument is that for each of these three policies, that basic mechanism, that basic trade-off, is basically losing its core meaning and its core uh, uh, rationale. Uh, the strict conditionality that the European Union uh, in, in effect imposes on these countries is not matched by clear incentives. Yes, the incentive of membership is still present in the case of Turkey, uh, but that is an increasingly politicized uh, question, as most of you probably know, and, and it is influenced by factors that have little to do with those very strict conditions. Uh, it has to do with normative or uh, even religious uh, arguments that have very little to do with what the Commission is actually doing in the country. In the case of the neighborhood policy, the trade-off is not there at all in the sense that some of these countries, particularly Ukraine and Moldova, they would like to apply for European Union membership, but this issue is out of the question. So the one incentive that the European Union could offer in exchange for its tough uh, requests is, is actually not uh, in place. In the case of Russia, Russia is not a candidate, doesn't want to be a candidate, and therefore the whole, uh, the whole acquis communautaire, as, is, as it is called, is actually a non-starter. Um, that has proven to be for Russia an excellent uh, tool to stop negotiations because the moment that the European Union has, well, we have common values. Well, the Russians answer, those are your common values, not our common values. So and, and that, that doesn't go off from there. Now, uh, so this is, this is the, 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 the conundrum. You have a remarkably similar toolkit of what the European Union is trying to do in these countries, but it doesn't have the tools inside it. And, and, and therefore, I would suggest that there are three things, or at least three levels, where the European Union could improve its uh, operational mechanisms in democracy promotion. And 
in, to some extent it is already using them. The first level is, of course, civil society uh, development. Now, the European Union does civil society uh, systems, but these, uh, its, its instruments are really um, a jungle of, of red tape that are not really accessible to most civil society activists. Just to give you an example, um, in some of its um, uh, financial mechanisms like the European Neighborhood Policy uh, Mechanism, uh, the EU has to agree with the local governments which civil society actor to fund. And of course, if some of the governments are not exactly democratic and you have to agree with them which civil society actor you fund, it's a bit of a vicious circle. Um, there, are, uh, w there is work done, especially at the national level in certain EU countries uh, where this is actually taking place, um, civil society development is taking place in a much more, uh, if you like, political way, because what the EU ends up doing in the end is very aseptical, very apolitical. So at the level of countries, especially foundations like uh, the German Stiftungen, they, they are doing this work in a much more political way, and, and in a way the European Union is following that path slowly. There is in place right now a so-called European Initiative for Democracy and Human Rights, which for example does not require the permission of the local governments to disburse its funds. And there has been uh, just launched in April 2008 a European Foundation for Democracy, which was something that the European Parliament called for some two years ago, and now it has been launched as an independent foundation. So these are uh, two steps on, on, on the uh, way I was indicating. That was the first level. The second level is, is actually governance, which Alex also uh, spoke about. Now, in the moment in which political conditionality gets so politicized, meaning that the conditions of the EU become a question of disagreement with the countries, then all the more there is a question of returning to what the European Union is best at doing, focusing on those very strict uh, good governance uh, standards. If you look at the World Bank governance indicators, most of the countries in the, in the uh, Black Sea region for the issues that, well, they measure, such as ability of a government to implement policies, the quality of public services, the level of corruptions, well, these countries, they are not only below the levels of Central Europe, in some cases they are below the level of North, North African uh, countries. And there is all more uh, a reason than to focus on good governance rather than democracy promotion per se. Um, the EU is doing that to some extent. There is a governance facility within the European neighborhood policy. It's uh, very modest in terms of funding. I, th I believe it's somewhere around 70 million euros. Um, but for example, Ukraine has been the first um, uh, recipient, among the first recipients of, this, of the funds disbursed under this uh, facility, uh, and the purpose is to encourage countries that are willing to improve their governance standards uh, to, uh, to do so. Um, the third level is around the region itself. Um, interestingly enough, in the uh, synergy, the Black Sea synergy, which we will hear about probably later on uh, today by the Austrian ambassador, democracy is the first priority. Now, these priorities are not put in, a, um, let's say, uh, they're not prioritized, they are just listed, but still, I think it's significant that, priority, uh, that democracy is number one. Um, what does this mean at the regional level? Well, I believe that it essentially means not only that the European Union tries to promote democracy, but also that there are exchanges of practices among the countries themselves. There was a proposal uh, we made at SEPS a couple of years ago about a sort of democracy review process, where essentially the countries agreeing to democracy as a priority, and there is, for example, those in the community of democratic choice, which put it in the name of the organization, uh, those countries agreeing to that, well, they could essentially meet every year to review their progress in terms of democratic standards according to, well, you know, reports, independent reports by scholars or, or, or the European Commission and, and so forth. Um, these are the three priorities then, civil society, governance and the regional cooperation. There would be a fourth one, which is membership, EU membership. Now, given the magnitude of the, of the, of the issue and the continuing introspection of the EU, I don't think that that's 
a really uh, a way to go right now, neither for Turkey nor for Ukraine uh, or for Moldova uh, in that respect. So my uh, take on this, um, and we could discuss this in fact, is that uh, there is much more to be done on the uh, ground level of what the standards are rather than trying to discuss uh, ultimate incentives that the EU cannot maintain for the time being. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's easy to forget that um, that the EU isn't and never was intended to be sort of a democracy building machine. When you look at the successes of the last uh, last decade um, and the the rhetoric, and especially as you say, as a, as a leading principle that that binds Europe, that democracy is important. And it, we, I guess, it's the hopeful yeah. idea that that it could continue in that way. Um, we'll we'll begin with questions from the audience. If if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, wait for the microphone to come to you, and and please introduce yourself. Yes, Ellen, in the back. Thank you, Ellen Ruskin from the Woodrow Wilson Center. I've been told I always wait till the end to ask my questions, so this time I'll try and get in the beginning. Um, I'm glad that uh, Fabrizio mentioned Moldova because I wanted to ask this question in the morning to uh, Rasa because um, I did a lot of work on and in Moldova last year and I found it very curious that the EU does not have the financial and concerted presence in Moldova that it really should and in fact it's the US through the Millennium Challenge Corporation funding under the anti-corruption programs that really has a strong presence until the issue of Transnistria is resolved and the EU doesn't seem to be working very hard to resolve that. Moldova can't accede to the EU. This is a pivotal country. It could lean to east, it could lean to west. Government's not sure. People are sure they want west. But there's still a strong feeling of Mother Russia. Could you please comment on uh, why the EU is not working harder and what you think it is doing that's effectual? Uh, well, I can tell you what it is doing. I, I wouldn't know if that's uh, if that's the assessment is so different from what you said. I mean, I don't believe that the EU is is uh, really um, prepared to take over responsibilities in in conflict resolution uh, uh, issues. But on that point, I think Alex actually might have something something to to add. Well, what the EU is doing, as you know, is there is there is the neighborhood policy. Then there is this border assistance mission, which is a very tiny assistance uh, mission on the border between. Uh, with, with Transnistria, and it has been hailed in Brussels as a major foreign policy achievement of the European Union. Um, and then, I mean, essentially what the European Union tries to do in terms of conflict resolution is not really to mediate or to power broker, is really, uh, is really to work around the conflict, to somehow make the population of the uh, secessionist entities somehow more attracted to the land, mainland, to support students, and this is very slow, very long term, but the bottom line is that Nobody, I believe, in Brussels doubts that the European Union does not possess the tools to actually uh, operate in a conflict-ridden uh, uh, area. So, of course, as long as Moldova is in a situation that you, in the situation that you described, the membership issue is, is out of the question. Um, my guess is that is that the European Union should not really. Um, leave it in the limbo for the time being because that's in a way what this neighborhood policy is doing. I would think that if there are the conditions for membership that can easily be just uh, announced in principle according to Article 49 of the Treaty of the European Union. I don't know which article will be in the new treaty, if it will ever be approved the new treaty. Uh, Ukraine and Moldova are European countries, so you are eligible at some point for membership. That doesn't, it doesn't give a deadline, it doesn't give you a timeline, but it makes them eligible. If that's not the case, they might as well know it right away. Well, if I could just add quickly, uh, I think if you were to compare Moldova with the, some of the other countries in the region, you know, we speak in a lot of our conversations on these topics is about what is Europe doing in the region? What can the West do? What can transatlantic structures do or the United States do? Well, frankly, uh, the leadership in the, re in the region <coughs> needs to reach out to the transatlantic structures as well and show that they're enthusiastic about them. Uh, and there you see the big difference between a country such as Georgia and a country like Moldova. So Vladimir Voronin's 
government has, despite their sort of uh, westward looking uh, policy, so called policies of the, uh, of the last couple of years, have frankly not done anything concrete to reach out to the European Union or any other transatlantic structures, uh, unlike Ukraine, unlike Georgia. Uh, I th regarding Moldova and its prospects, there's probably sort of one reason for doubt and one reason for hope uh, just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the reason for doubt <coughs> being that uh, Moscow, uh, I think it was a week and a half ago, uh, made a new suggestion uh, to Voronin in that they could broker peace to uh, uh, resolution in, the, in Transnistria, but under a sort of Russian brokered framework that would involve a number of uh, sort of uh, eastward looking incentives, if you will. Uh, at the same time, uh, we see this new uh, European uh, East, Eastern Partnership, I should say, proposal by uh, Sweden and Poland, which was uh, mentioned this morning. And that explicitly includes Moldova as a full partner. It also explicitly mentions membership as a future prospect for Moldova. Um, and we'll see what uh, the uh, European Council discusses <clears throat> in a couple of days. However, there is certainly hope to be had there. Thank you. Panagiotou uh, Manoli from the ICBSS, the International Center for Black Studies. Um, well, uh, about the, what it was said previously for the role of the EU in democracy building uh, in the area, that's where I want to uh, say a few things. Um, one thing is that the EU, it seems that it has as a, a political goal the creation of well-governed states, a ring of well-governed states. So it seems that um, uh, it's going to focus more on that issue. Uh, and as, you, as Fabrizio said correctly, um, it assisted in democracy building through the enlargement process. That was the policy number one. Okay, it, it has historically, we are moving into a second step. And I think that that concept of well-governed states, it's going to be realized step by step. Um, then, of course, if we want to discuss the issue of what, what anybody, what EU or any other actor is doing on democracy building is not so easy to see, as Fabrizio said, the, the exact tools and the exact results. It's not like, you know, we don't have a route, we're going to give money, build it, and in five years we're going to see the outcome. It takes time. Uh, but we've seen what has been happening in Southeast Europe, in Central Europe, in other parts. Uh, so now I think it's the time for, for the Black Sea. Uh, of course, democracy is linked to the security problems in the area. It's not accidental that we have democracy issues still open in countries that they do face um, issues regarding their own existence as a, as a state entity and they do not control actually the, the, their territory. Um, but um, the issue of um, democratic um, security then is, is, is central and I would say that the EU maybe can also do more in parallel to working with the civil society, we could do even more in the security sector itself. Uh, we have the special representative for the, the Caucasus, so th I would link definitely security and, 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 and democracy. About Moldova, if I'm not mistaken, one of the most successful examples of EU's intervention in the area is actually the, the border mission that exists with, uh, between Moldova and, and Ukraine, and I think this is a success story um, of the EU in, in the area. And the last thing also is about corruption. We cannot do many uh, for democracy if corruption is not really uh, uh, fought, and um, it seems that the EU can also do uh, more things maybe through the synergy. Uh, we have to see that. An open question is, as you said, there is not going to be membership prospect for the countries in the East ENP. Maybe the EU is going to give more of an economic uh, access to the internal market, uh, on the, uh, but, but at the same time requesting good governance in there. Maybe this is going to happen. I don't know what you think about that. Like. Uh, uh, access to economic market, but you know, then uh, reforms for uh, in terms of the good governance in the area. Um, I don't think that we had a historical uh, 
and uh, the same process in the Mediterranean. Maybe my memory fails me, but I think there was an effort to link economic uh, development in the area with uh, um, democracy building, but it didn't go very well there. But for the East ENP, maybe we can say something. That was all. Thank you. Should I? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I see actually two. Uh, you made many comments, so I'm not going to answer to all of them. Just I picked two, and I, I see two ironies, um, not related to what you said, but to the topic in itself. The first irony is that enlargement that you mentioned was the most successful policy. Ironically enough, it was always presented as the most successful foreign policy of the European Union. <laughs> But in fact, enlargement, the whole success is when it stops being a foreign policy, meaning when the countries become members of the European Union. And the crucial distinction here is that for all these other policies, not being their membership perspective, they really do become foreign policies. So really, this is the litmus test for the EU, this region, because here you, are, you have really the, 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 the movement from membership to partnership, and then you have to really explain to these people what partnership means. Uh, the second irony has to do with the economic side, and that is that, in my view, for some of the countries in this region, particularly Ukraine, the whole set of policies that the EU has uh, defined in the economic field is actually um, as good as it gets, really. Uh, what they are going to negotiate is a so-called, you have heard about it for sure, uh, deep free trade area. And essentially what the deep free trade area is that Ukraine willingly agrees to take over the whole internal market regulation of the EU, which is a bunch of papers that goes through the roof here, and to implement that without the prospect of membership. So essentially, the whole internal market are key without the prospect of membership. If they, are, they, they achieve that feat, I mean, I, I suppose that's, that's really as good as it gets. Um, and indeed, they tried it in the Mediterranean, and it never really went very uh, far. Uh, Essentially because there, the, the, there are other issues that in a way um, pollutes a little bit the, the relationship from the perception of being uh, dominated by the EU post-colonial consideration. In, in this region you don't really have them. Uh, you have it in relation to Russia when it comes to Ukraine, but not in relation to the EU. And that's really uh, a, good, a good way to, to, to start. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right here. Maybe we can take a couple questions. Yeah. If you just speak into the microphone, it should be turned on. <coughs> My name is Vasilis Tsakis from the Black Sea Trade Development Bank. Um, quick question. You mentioned, uh, Alexander's mentioned the World Bank and mentioned also um, the international companies. And uh, Fabrizio mentioned mostly the EU. What about what the region does for the region? Like, um, you know, the Black Sea Economic Cooperation, it has a lot of um, centers, like the ICBSS, it has the bank, it has the PubSec, it has the Business Council, and there's a lot that the region does for the region. And it does it for governance. I work in procurement in particular. Uh, the policies are very important. And it does it also by associating people that come from the former Soviet Union with those that come from Europe. So maybe you can give me some of your thoughts on that. Thanks. I think there was a question uh, next. Next, if you could pass the microphone. Yeah. Back. Thank you. I'm Catherine Messina Payach. I'm with the National Democratic Institute. And I had a comment, which I guess would end in the question of just asking your opinion, which is what I seem to hear from both speakers is a distinction between representative government and effective or efficient government, or the distinction between good governance and democracy promotion. And I would argue that you can't really separate them, that it's very difficult to have effective, efficient government if it's not representative because then they're not accountable. The state is not accountable to anyone. And what I hear missing in the, um, I guess, assistance programs or sort of good governance programs is accountability of the states of the region and the governments of the region to their own people. I'm hearing that they're accountable to the EU, to international agencies like the World Bank, um, maybe private investors. You know, it's great that BP is doing things. But what, are, what is the European Union doing to try to empower civil society to hold their own governments accountable? And I, I appreciate some of what you mentioned about some of the new um, 
mechanisms being created, but what, I'm, I'm just curious what else can be done. Uh, I know the US, USAID is putting money into grants for civil society, but just giving money to them doesn't necessarily change the practice that, that goes on in country. So I would just ask sort of your opinion and any um, insights you have. I think this goes to the core of how the EU policy is different from U.S. policies or individual state-driven policies because of the, you know, the, the fact that the EU doesn't, uh, doesn't, it can't impose things, but it, it initiates processes and how these processes change. And that seems to be the, the lesson that, that Washington needs to learn in order to deal with the EU. So if you, do you have something? Well, well I, I, in many ways, uh, the Black Sea Synergy project has significant civil society support uh, pieces within it, if I remember correctly, and there's really no one who can speak about that better than Fabrizio Tassinari. Okay, that was if, it? You wanna, okay. if you want to talk about Black Sea Synergy's no, role no, no, with, okay. supporting okay. civil society, um, um, you're right that, in fact, not enough is being done. Uh, but then again, within the context, it's very difficult. Uh, to partner, as you mentioned, with civil society when, for example, there may need to be sponsorship from the government, et cetera, when you may be undermining uh, relations with the government f with whom you need very good relations regarding energy and other things, uh, broader strategic reasons, reasons, civil society sometimes tends to lose out. That is certainly happening in this case. However, I think there are some efforts being done under Black Sea Synergy. Um, okay, so there was first your question about the region itself. Absolutely. I was asked to speak about the EU, which in a way is easier and fun, but definitely if the initiative doesn't come from the region itself, it, it, it can't really go anywhere. It's not sustainable if it is only from Brussels or elsewhere. So definitely I am uh, both in, in the field of democracy promotion, which we are discussing uh, here and in general for the regional cooperation, if in, in institutions like BSEC, uh, even the community of democratic choice or the Guam, if they weren't there, they would have to be invented. That being said, I don't think, because uh, I think you said you worked in the um, BSEC Trade and uh, Development Bank. Well, yeah, I don't think that will work in the economic field too much, this regional element, not in terms of the interaction among countries, which again is crucial, but if you remember, uh, I, st I must still be a priority for BSEC, this idea of a free trade area, the regional free trade area. I don't know if it still is a priority, because that was for a long time a priority, and I was always struck to read that, because that is legally unfeasible. Uh, these countries have all bilateral relations with the EU, from the custom union to uh, privileged uh, partnership, and they cannot just enter uh, uh, a, a regional free trade agreement among each other without involving Brussels. So on the, let's say, legalistic level, uh, there may be a limited scope for action, but definitely on the practical level, if it doesn't come from there, it's not going to be sustainable. Um, on your point, uh, I think this is a very uh, complicated discussion, which I don't feel um, too qualified to enter. I mean, the debate between good governance and democracy promotion, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't make a dichotomy. I don't make a separation. I do believe that if you have a rose revolution or an orange revolution without uh, tackling corruption, uh, it's not going to work in the long run. But definitely the governments have to be accountable to their own people in order to be legitimate and incredible. I also mentioned uh, in the presentation before that the European Union is doing something, especially in relation to civil society assistance. Um, I must say the best things done are at the level of member states. Uh, they are much more uh, credible, much more longer term. I, I'm thinking about quasi-governmental institutions like uh, Danida in Denmark or, or, or SIDA in Sweden. I mean, these are uh, institutions that are well-funded and have been working on specific projects with civil society for a uh, number of years. Uh, perhaps you could compare it a little bit with the NED here, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, and again, I'm not sure to what extent you can replicate that to the EU level, whether the EU can actually create such a, a way of operating. I mentioned before this new foundation for uh, democracy promotion, but that was called for the parliament, from the parliament for really two or three years, and it was uh, lack of... Havel, the former Czech president, that eventually said, okay, we have to do this thing, otherwise we're never going to get anywhere. 
but it's an independent thing. It doesn't come from the from from the EU. So. Uh, if I could just address the first question, I think I, in many ways, have to disagree slightly with my colleague, and, and in fact, some of the uh, discussion of uh, regional efforts uh, this morning, uh, whether it's regarding BSEC, whether it's regarding Guam, uh, CDC, you mentioned, although there hasn't been all that much going on on that front, uh, it seems to me that if you look at the region, and this is not to say that it is not a coherent re region, there are many, you know, as we have discussed this morning, a uh, number of reasons for it to be viewed as such, and it is most likely developing in that direction if you, if you look at the long-term perspective. At the same time, if you, do, if you take a strategic view of the region, it seems that the, tr that the trends increasingly point to the fact that there is less and less room for uh, regional initiatives that are between a European-slash-NATO sphere and a sphere in, that is increasingly dominated by Moscow, whether that be through uh, energy development, whether it be through the buying up of uh, companies within countries, infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, there is less and less room in between. I think there it now, of course, there's a difference between a regional organization functioning as such as a regional organization and something like the Visegrad group uh, that we saw in Central Europe, which was a regional organization, but meant to head in a certain direction, if you will. Uh, I think that for genuinely regional organizations to survive within the context of the next two decades or so, uh, they will have to tend towards a Visegrad group uh, style of uh, organization or be increasingly marginalized. That's provocative, but I uh, thought I'd make the point. A question there? My name's Thomas Grindley. You, m you mentioned a, st a strategic partnership with Russia. However, it seems that Russia prefers to deal with individual countries, and it seems to have a divisive policy. How would you explain Russia's policy to the EU? And is it consistent with a strategic partnership? Uh, excellent question. Um, I think uh, the uh, Russia's basic policy towards the EU is not to count the EU as an actor at all. Uh, essentially, it is divide and rule the different member states and deal with those that are more, uh, let's say, uh, deferent to Russia's uh, uh, requests and, and, and interests. Uh, you uh, have plenty of studies demonstrating how uh, Russia has developed throughout the 90s and regardless of the different governments in Germany, France and Italy, including a very close partnership, um, including in the energy field, while it marginalized other countries, not only the Central Europeans, which would be the obvious target, but also North European and, and the UK recently, which in a way were more vocal on issues concerning, for example, domestic developments in Russia. So Russia's uh, approach that has been working pretty successfully so far is to deal with the individual capital and and somehow uh, leave the uh, technicalities to to Brussels but without really lifting it to a strategic level which takes me to your second question what is a strategic partnership really about well according to the European Union which really pushed for this strategic partnership it has to do with binding Russia as much as possible to its normative standards and, 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 and rules. Uh, this has been the uh, rationale throughout the 90s, and in a way, I, I'm afraid that the European Union hasn't understood that not only times have changed, but that this wasn't really the case in the 90s either, that Russia would adopt European norms and standards. Uh, so in practice, this will mean that the European Union and Russia will now enter negotiations for a so-called strategic partnership agreement, which will be about 40 different sectors and dialogues on issues from phytosanitary uh, standards to, uh, to uh, foreign policy. And on that basis, each of the European Union member states will have to ratify the treaty and Russia will have to do the same. I can tell you that in the previous case, when the European Union and Russia negotiated a treaty like that, it was in the mid-90s, it took them six years 
to negotiate it and ratify it. And the treaty was essentially discarded the very moment it was ratified. Um, now they are getting into the same process, essentially because this is something that the Euro Euro European Union really, or rather the Commission, really wants to do in order to somehow anchor Russia. Um, Russia likes the name, it sounds nice, strategic partnership, but they don't want to do all the work. And on that score, I think they are right. Uh, um, I mean, the, the, the whole uh, negotiations. So they, just, they would just prefer to have a sort of declaration and then we go along with business as usual. So uh, you have obviously um, uh, a dichotomy there and I'm not sure I can solve it here, but there is a point in your question, definitely. Uh, we have a question right in front. Um, could you I, wait for the microphone and no, 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 uh, could you wait for the microphone? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank, there it is. thank you. Um, I have um, uh, I, I have two two question comments. One uh, is concerning a country that was not mentioned, with Armenia, and uh, nonetheless, I think that this this is a, a, cent, a core issue in in, in in the in the relations among them. The second thing is that I want to, to ask you about two organizations that somehow tried to work along uh, the same lines originally and which have now slid in the background. What is the Council of Europe? Uh, and the second, where Russia is a member, a full member, Georgia is a full member, Turkey is a full member. And so the second is on security issues, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. I mean, the issues we talked about, as we just pulled over and so on, those, those were central tasks. So I think, uh, uh, I wonder yeah, whether it, uh, whether what Mr. Peterson said about the waning space for for other than other actors also to applies to those two things, or whether they would not be a, a kind of in between stations between the stark alternative of a, a policy or, or shaped and oriented towards the West and towards Russia. Thank you. I'll certainly address Armenia. Um, since uh, you, you probably followed the elections in Armenia in February and then the um, uh, unrest in the capital Yerevan and uh, martial law declared afterwards, uh, you know, it's interesting in many ways that uh, Armenia got a lot of bad press through, through this. Uh, they lost a lot of friends in Brussels and in other European capitals. Uh, at the same time, I would argue that... Uh, the change in leadership presents uh, significant opportunities um, if those opportunities can be taken advantage of, uh, particularly on the European side. Because here we have uh, the new president, Serge Sarkisian, uh, while having significant uh, links with Moscow and is not going to jeopardize those, uh, has on many occasions since uh, the tumultuous elections reached out <clears throat> to European capitals and said, we would like you to be much more involved uh, than you have been in the past regarding Nagorno-Karabakh, regarding the um, uh, Armenian-Turkish border closing, uh, regarding also, uh, I mean, he's, he certainly tried very hard to burnish his um, sort of democratic reform credentials. Uh, and I think that's an olive branch that should be taken advantage of uh, on the part of uh, Europe and also the United States as much as um, strategic interests allow. Uh, it is encouraging to see that on the Turkish side, just after his uh, elections, uh, uh, the uh, president and foreign minister were some of the first to congratulate Sarkisian on his victory and uh, ask for dialogue regarding the uh, border closing. Uh, and it seems as if uh, Yerevan is willing to take that up, certainly more than in the previous uh, administration. Uh, and at the same time, now that Nagorno-Karabakh is coming to a head, uh, something that has not been in the headlines but uh, is occurring, uh, it, it is important, I think, that, again, transatlantic institutions, European capitals, Washington take advantage of uh, changes occurring, take advantage of, for example, the increased urgency in Baku to have a change on Karabakh uh, and whether there can be some reconciliation facilitated on the part of transatlantic institutions there. I'll take the other question then on OECE and, and the Council of Europe. Um, I think they have a room which is actually, I'm glad you asked that question because when it comes to values, I mentioned before that the European Union and Russia clash on this value issue. We have common values, but what are these values in practice? We don't know. Well, 
there are dozens of conventions, protocols signed in the Council of Europe and OECE context by both Russia and the EU member states. So when it comes to defining what the values of this bilateral partnership are about, you have them all there. Now the question there, however, is implementation. Because whenever it comes to implementing these conventions or protocols on issues related to uh, protection of minorities or independence of the judiciary, Russia will, all, will, uh, will always uh, lash out s at certain European countries uh, for doing a bad job and for Europe having double standards. You had it a couple of years ago in Finland uh, when the European leaders had the bad idea of meeting around the same table, all of 20 uh, five at the time with uh, Vladimir Putin, and then they started some of them uh, lashing at, at uh, um, you know, Russia's record on uh, independence of the judiciary. And well, Putin stood up and said, "Look, uh, the word mafia was not invented in Russia." <laughs> so. That's good. We're um, we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, but I want um, to ask you to uh, join me in thanking our very insightful speakers. Thank you.